Welcome to Conversations with Gurmami. This is episode 23. Our guest is Daniel Balai Bata. He's recently written a novel called The Smoldering Tears. Therefore, it allows the reader to look at red terror from this angle without losing sight of all the physical and psychological atrocities, such as execution and torture. That way, one might get a glimpse on the magnitude of the social consequences of the red terror. A teenage couple, teenagers Gire and Suyum, fell in love with, with each other at the right time, but perhaps the wrong era. They were just like any teenagers, like teenagers in any peaceful and free societies of the West, with dreams and ambitions. But they had to fight hard to keep the flame between them. The story is set in Ethiopia during a violent period of bloodshed, torture, and mass murder of Ethiopians from all walks of life, language groups, genders, ages, and professions. This campaign of violence is referred to as the Red Terror, and it took place at the hands of Mengistu Halamarim's military junta known as the Derg, shortly after the deposition of Emperor Haile Selassie. Daniel, tell us about your novel, The Smoldering Tears. The book is a fictional love story of a teenage couple and their family during the Red Terror era in the late 1970s and 1980s, early 1980s in Ethiopia. But their stories are inspired by actual events. An 18-year-old Gide, her fiancé, 19-year-old Siyum, and his mother, Hewitt, are the main heroes in the book. So as it narrates their journey, it is also an attempt to reflect the time and the trial of ordinary citizens in their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. The teenage couple and their families are more or less the typical traditional Ethiopian families in most towns and cities. Therefore, their stories in many ways relate to the stories of thousands of others. Now, Red Terror was a state program, an era most traumatizing, a dark chapter in our history. The world doesn't know very much about it, neither do many Ethiopians talk about it. And our silence may have contributed to the widespread ignorance around the world with regards to such a devastating time. Many victims' families do not talk about it. People who had lived through the time, and especially those who were tortured and persecuted, would not want to talk about it. Millions of others who were terrorized by the regime day in and day out may want to keep it in the past as it is too painful to remember. But also I think there is some sort of shame and sense of guilt among many of us that this had to happen to us, that we often try to suppress it. This shame and guilt stem from our enduring pride as a great nation rich in history and culture. But yet, despite our pride and strong conviction of our societal power, we somehow feel we as a society had failed. So our proud communities during that time, this community that had for centuries protected their members with a strong sense of moral duties and shared sentiments of altruism, they were forced to become bystanders when their members were executed right before their eyes. Their rights to shed tears over the dead and to give them proper burial were denied. And mind you, the perpetrators were fellow Ethiopians. And everything that the Red Terror had unleashed on us was contrary to our values as Ethiopians. So Red Terror didn't just leave us with a painful memory to reminisce about, but also a big question. How was it possible for such a strong and proud society to succumb to the loss of red terror that persecuted humanity itself. And I guess you can understand what had motivated me to write the book. So I'm sure you can imagine how traumatizing the experience of red terror could be, and not many people wish to talk about it. But it has to be told in whatever manner or form. Museum, documentaries, in classrooms, or through fictional love stories, so on and so forth. It has to be told. So I hope my book will provide a lens or a window, no matter how small, through which the reader will peek into the lives of Ethiopians during this terrible time. The book expounds more on the cultural and moral aspect of our lives. Love, relationship, families, community spirits, and friendship. And on the fact that Ethiopians have the highest regard for humanity. Okay. So now, what, what are you attempting to do here with this story? So my attempt was to bring the reader to the time of these teenagers to explain their struggle from within.
from within. It's interesting to hear this because it's being told from within, and Ethiopians are generally great storytellers. Uh, for one thing, you just said Ethiopians are storytellers, and I agree with you. Ethiopia is a land of writers, by the way. Uh, we call them the Rasian. Many people have had this Alamayo, even uh, Abegwenya, Mamo, Udena, and many others. Uh, they have influenced me greatly. I have grown up, I grew up reading their books. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, personal stories and other issues, many Ethiopians, they may not talk about themselves, let alone an issue such as red terror. It's a very traumatizing issue, whether you are the family of a victim or just the neighbor, because everybody was terrorized anyways. It's not something we would like to talk about. We try to suppress it as if sometimes it didn't happen to us. It's very traumatizing to reminisce about. It's not something that we wanted to talk about, but at the same time, there is always subconsciously that deep sense of guilt or sense of shame because we're not talking about it. And as you know, we hear about Ethiopia on the media as, as a country that has gone through a lot of poverty and starvation and famine. But nobody talks about those issues like, such as red terror and war. And uh, for many of us who came to Western countries where we start to live our peaceful life, it gives us, it gives us enough time to reflect, but at the same time, we try to keep it uh, in the past. And I think that is a shame, and I think that's one of the attempts, uh, in my case, to talk about it. We have to talk about it, and we cannot expect anybody else to come and tell us our story. And like you said, we are the storytellers, whether it's a fiction or a reality, and nobody can tell it better than ours. Why did you choose fiction as, uh, as, as a form uh, to, to tell the story? Um, um, I think there is always that debate in your mind, what really happened. First, you have a great sense of identity, who we are. And love, one of the, uh, the things that were disrupted and severely persecuted, love and emotion themselves, were the ones that were persecuted during Red Terror and you will see it at the beginning of the book. Uh, Red Terror, not only did it uh, torture and massacre or executed thousands of people, but its intention was to uh, incapacitate society itself by directly attacking the emotional feeling, the sentiments that we have in comforting each other. Uh, by attacking the rituals and the traditional practices with which we deal with death, birth, relationship, and all kind of social uh, uh, lives. So anything that bonds, whether it's love or friendship, was a threat to the regime at the time. So I thought maybe talking about Gide and Suyum, and Suyum's mother, Hewat, which is the hero in this, in this book, would probably redirect the reader into the actual time, mm. the actual experience, actual historical period of Red Terror. I think that that probably was my main intention, but it kind of shaped up itself. I, I'm going to jump all over the place uh, and ask you this question. N you've, you've published this novel in May, yes. right? M May of 2015. What does it mean what does this mean to you now that, that you've written this and, and you've put it out there and, and you're sharing it, uh, you're, you're sharing this story with the public and readers? Well, what, what does it mean to you personally? Because, I, because I, I, I'll, sorry to interrupt, because I know that to have written this book must have taken, and when I say I know, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, you that it, it's, it's taken a lot of courage. Uh, you know, an, an effort, creative effort, but also courage because uh, y you're, you're telling a story about a, an incident that, that terrorized and, and, and decimated a, a country, right, at a particular time in history. But what the, does it mean to you to have written 
uh, th this novel? Well, what does it mean to you? I, I think uh, it's an achievement in a sense that I feel no matter how small I, I contributed in that story, storytelling, it's a duty for me. And the fact that most victims, many of the victims, most Ethiopians and the victims as well, they should not be forgotten. And this is not, uh, red terror is totally alien to us. The laws of red terror, they are totally alien against our values. So as I mentioned earlier, that era, that traumatizing period, not, not, not only did it leave us with uh, bad memories, but with that historical dilemma, a question. So how was it possible? So there's always that question kind of bouncing inside my head. So it has to be written. So my country, my, no matter how small, my book is out there. It's not a personal glory. It's not the money. I just wanted to put it out there for Ethiopians and non-Ethiopians readers, especially uh, young, uh, uh, young men and women, Ethiopian descent, who were born or raised in Western countries who had no idea how their parents ended up here they can probably have a look at this book and see, well, this is what was going on. But at the same time, there are so many stories, stories of atrocity that are totally untold, and they have to be told. And I, I kind of feel the obligation to do that. Our Red Terror, as I, as I said, uh, it was a dark chapter in our history but it was neglected in the global geopolitical discourse. Never was covered very much in the Western media. So we have to come, we have, we have to, um, there is a museum in Addis Ababa, which is a wonderful museum, and uh, they, have, uh, they have created so much awareness about Red Terror, and also there are other people who are writing as well. So I have to add to, the, to their effort as well. It's, uh, no matter how small, it's a contribution. And I will encourage others to do the same in whatever form to remind the world that Ethiopia had gone through such a dark era. What do, um, so far, you've, you've published this novel, but what, what do friends, family, members of um, you know your circles, be it the Ethiopian community, the Canadian, Ethiopian community, so what have they told you about the novel and yeah what what have they told you well uh, some of my non-ethiopian friends for one thing they were very shocked to read it but at the same time they appreciate the fact that uh, ethiopia is a very proud society a very proud culture because in the book that's what it talks about uh, from a cultural angle to look at red terror not just from the physical torture and execution, but you have to look at it from the devastation on culture itself in order to understand the social magnitude of it. Uh, so they can see how proud community we are, how proud society we are. And many Ethiopians, they talked about it with me, and they were very supportive that I talked about it, and they agree with me that it has to be brought up. It's time. And they kind of, uh, well, they supported me, they appreciated the fact that I wrote this book. I have also met with uh, a few individuals who are members uh, of families executed during the Red Terror. Mm. And uh, I had a tremendous support from them and uh, a lot of hugs and uh, we, we still keep in contact. So there is a tremendous amount of support, and I'm, which I'm very glad. And the book is very neutral. It doesn't glorify any political or anything, uh, any organization. It just what happened to Ethiopia. And, and we, now we have all this memory. Where do we put them? How do we present them to the world? That's what the book is all about. And my way of putting it is through a fictional story. So the fiction is the love story. But everything else depicted in that book was already happening. Mm. So it's an attempt to bring the reader or my readers into that era so that they can feel it from within as they read it. So uh, to come to the question, I'm getting a lot of support and uh, 
mostly from non-Ethiopian young readers, and they were they were shocked even to read some of the stories, and uh, many Ethiopians as well. But most importantly, I was happy to meet with some uh, individuals, Ethiopians, whose uh, sisters and parents were executed, and uh, and we had a great time. We talked about it, and uh, it was. I felt very good that I. I to me, it meant a lot to talk to these people about my book and to get their support and appreciation. It meant a lot. Do you think uh, the Ethiopian uh, community, Ethiopian community is not the right word for it, but do you think Ethiopians as a whole have uh, acknowledged and uh, acknowledged this this tragic event and uh, have learned from from the event? But do you think they've uh, learned from this and 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 have moved on and i don't say moved on like forgotten about it mm -hmm. but as you mentioned before a lot of people don't want to talk about it right but do you think they they they've learned from it uh, yes we have learned from it in terms of moving on uh it's very hard to say because when red terror was uh when it was declared as a state program the name Red Terror was not given to it by opposition to discredit the regime it was a name that was adopted by the regime to signify pe uh, te terror period now as I mentioned earlier it directly attacked culture itself not the individuals by attacking cultural practices with which we deal with death and relationship it incapacitated society what's more not only did the regime disallow victims family uh, I mean not allow banning tears shedding tears or proper uh, burial oh sorry they actually th th this was part of the policy the, yes the it was a policy now the program uh, yeah it was Please e elaborate on that because a, a lot of us don't know. Yeah, so Red Terror, as part of its policy, its rules, there is no crying for the executed. Even a mother cannot shed, shed any tears. Tears were punishable. You cannot wear black dress. Uh, to mourn. To mourn. There's no you, mourning. There is no mourning. And our mourning are very ritualistic. Right. There is, uh, when a person dies in Ethiopia, people come from far and near to bid him or her farewell, to mourn with the family together. And the uh, community takes the family, the grieving family, through the process of mourning. But Red Terror does not allow that. So, for one thing, most victims were killed. They were executed either in front of the family or in front of their house. And they were left on the road or on the street for display. Then they will be picked up and they will, they will be thrown in unmarked graves or mass graves. Not in a church or a holy ground of the Muslim. Not in those areas. So there is a total alienation here. Now the mothers or the families not only can they not grieve for them and nobody is allowed to come and co comfort them so you can see what I meant by killing the spirit of the community by not allowing people to mourn properly but there are some sad stories one is already mentioned in the book but others you probably see them in the uh, uh, the museum of Hol the uh, Red Terror Memorial, where individuals or families and friends or community members were asked to dance around the bodies that were executed. You well, gotta be kidding. Yes, you will see that actually on the v on YouTube in uh, uh, the uh, memorial, the museum of uh, Red Terror Mem Memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, there was. Uh, a town where a mother, her son was shot in front of her and she was forced to do the ululating sound, you know, uh, ululation. And there were others who were asked to shout a slogan 
in support of the regime. And they had to do it because they will risk themselves killed or another member of the family, either in prison or at home, could be shot as well. So what the regime has done is eternalizing their grief by creating a sense of guilt. If my son or my daughter is shot before my eyes, if I applaud or if I shouted a, uh, a slogan or dance around her body, then the grief is eternal. And the guilt is eternal. It's, it's lasting guilt. So that's what I meant. Maybe moving on? I don't think so. I don't think pe people can move on. Later on, when the regime collapsed, the new government allowed uh, excavation, some bodies. But whose bodies? We don't even know. How do families identify their bodies? Does it give the families closure? It's not like uh, burying your kin yourself uh, right at the time of death. So that's what the government had banned. Uh, those are the practices, the traditional practices, the cultural, the religious practices that were outlawed. So there was a total disalienation at a macro and micro level. People cannot deal with their grief personally, and community cannot deal with its grief. You know, in Ethiopia, the very close-knit communities, a death in, uh, in a family, uh, a death is not just a death in a family. It's death in the community as well. We mourn together. Birds, the sanctity of birds and the sanctity of death are equally valued. Community takes families through the process of birth from the beginning until uh, the child grows and at the same time takes the grieving uh, family through the process of mourning. But Red Terror denied us all this. So 20, 30 years later, if bones were collected and buried properly at a church, I don't think if they're going to give any closure or any satisfaction to the family. So learning, yes, we have learned so much from Red Terror. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why we don't want to talk about it. The more you reflect, the more you think about it, the more you feel shocked. You, you, you know, it's very traumatizing. But I think there is always a healing process. Even reading a book like this one, the museum itself, revisiting it in what in what way we in whatever way we can, it's a healing process. We we come to terms with it. Well, I was born and raised in Ethiopia. Uh, it's a town called Adigrat, and that's a place where a lot of uh, uh, red terror activities took place. And uh, I was there when. Uh, some of my schoolmates and a one classmate, parents of my friends, many uh, great citizens were killed in in my hometown. And, uh, and my my I grew up in a, in an area where there is a tremendous amount of cultural practices, and uh, and I think that's one of the shocking experience that I had. And the, the question, what really happened to us? And uh, so. I have witnessed firsthand Red Terror itself. I was very young, but I still remember what happened. Um, then I came to Canada, uh, it was in the 1980s, the regime was still there. And here I spent many years and uh, I studied at Colton University and I have a master's degree in sociology. And uh, as you can understand, Ethiopia, with its uh, vast culture and tradition, it's uh, quite a case for anthropology and sociology. So much to write about. And, right. uh, and uh, I think, uh, well, pretty much that's it about me. <laughs> Tell us about the characters I in the novel. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, as teenagers, Gide and Suyum, they fell in love at the right time, like any teenager but it was the wrong era. Uh, Gide is a beautiful, high-spirited 18-year-old girl. She likes to talk, very chatty, a lot of smile. Suyum is a 19-year-old man. He is very charming, very wise and charismatic, 
very patient man. His mother, Hewitt, is a stoic, as well as a tenacious woman who fought tyranny with all her might. And their story takes place in a small town called Ademai. And one of my heroes here, actually the, the main hero here is Hewitt. Hewitt is Suyum's mother. And uh, she, she reminds me of many other women in Ethiopia, mothers or you know, young women or old women who had to endure so much uh, confronting the agents of the regime all the time and trying to plead with those regime, members of the regime either to release their husband or father or son or daughter and who had to endure all the uh, humiliation, degradation at the same time, uh, all that persecution. And as I mentioned, uh, Gide and Suyum are a young couple, very much in love with each other, so many dreams and, uh, and ambitions, who are looking forward to, uh, to, to build their family and all that. But they had to fight hard in order to keep the flame between them alive. Mm. So um, in, in that era, during the Red Terror era, anything that bonds people, whether it's a friendship or love, it has to be disbanded. Mm. It becomes a threat to the regime. Publicly? You mean. Publicly, in any way. Because everything has, even if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to go to, if you wanted to spend so much time uh, in religious practices, you are attracting attention to yourself because this this is seen as being subversive. You have to pay full attention to the revolution itself, to the regime, to the ideology. So there is no way that you can hide or mask or stay away from all the uh, activity the regime was prescribing for you. 100% submission to... It was a total submission. Uh, whatever you do, first of all, you have to... Um, you have to give in to this transcendental, quote-unquote, transcendental revolution. Right. Everything. That's, uh, the re so the government was making sure that the revolution or the ideology and the regime's uh, ideology was above and uh, beyond everything. Mm. So in order for you to do the ordinary thing that you would do, you have to have an approval, some sort of approval or an okay, as long as you are submissive and showing unconditional support to the regime. Mm. So w w the hero here, H Hewitt, is there a reason why you chose a female uh, a heroine, I guess mm -hmm. the word would be, or, yes. or, or hero or whatever? Why is, and, and what role does traditionally role? Role is probably not the right word, but it, it's interesting choice. It, can you tell us what that means uh, as far as women in Ethiopia? Well, what symbolism does that have? Well, and in Ethiopia, throughout history, women uh, play a big role in our history, in our political structure. For years, for thousands of years, women were always uh, fighters, and uh, they were also great community leaders, great uh, family leaders. And sometimes when there is a political or any kind of disaster in the country, uh, women tend to be the main victims uh, and for one thing they are the ones more than anybody else who play a major role in keeping community and family together mm. I'm not sure if you're familiar we have uh, organizations whether religious or community organizations whether it's Edur or uh, or some religious, some non-religious, women play the major part. And also in times of death, and times of birth, mm -hmm. women, whether they're neighbors or family or friends, they play major part in any kind of event, whether it's religious or uh, community event, women are the ones who uh, perpetuate, perpetuate our 
community spirit. So they are very strong fighters, and it's a great amount of endurance by women. And Hewitt, uh, she represents millions of Ethiopian women with her tenacity, her endurance. And I, I chose her because she was face-to-face -face meeting with the uh, rogue agents of the regime. And her aim was to triumph at the end, mm. and which she did. But I will let you read it at the end, uh, you know, how it happens. So he went, I, I guess I made her uh, my favorite and my hero uh, just because I think she kind of reminds me uh, the community itself. Mm. So she she represents the community. The community itself, mm. the the sense of humanity in all of us. And she, so she was a strong woman. She's a strong woman, and uh, I I thought maybe she she would you know put her to uh, to be the major player. Uh, uh, I thought maybe that would give a sense of. Uh, that community fight against the regime. Okay, this is your first novel. Yes. So, explain to us y your process in writing. Do you have a particular ritual, a particular time you would write? W you know, would you drink coffee before? W what? Uh, how long did it take you to put the, the novel together? And, yeah. Yeah, in this, in this particular case, uh, I think it took me quite an unexpectedly long time. The reason for that is I just had I had to put it off for a while, and there were times that I had a computer crash, I lost my copy, oh, no. I had to rewrite it again, and there were times that I just forgot about it. I mean, I put it aside and I was very busy, uh, but it was really the last two years that I sat down and I said I have to finish it, and uh, which I did. Mm. Uh, Funny, when I write essays or other articles, I am a very organized person, methodical, that's how I write. Mm -hmm. But this book, it was random, it started as random. Mm. And uh, I, I just wrote randomly, I think I was trying to put everything that was in my mind. And uh, it took me a while to kind of rearrange it. So I started probably with the, what a story, a particular story about, uh, you will find at the beginning, that was the main story that kind of promoted, uh, prompted me into writing more about it. But there were other stories as well, so I had to kind of reshuffle them, put it together. So if I have to write again about any novel, then I know I have learned my <laughs> my my lesson from this one and I will probably go to the way I write my essays or other articles very methodical step by step but for this one I guess it's written out of emotional uh, so much emotional uh, energy involved in it so it was sometimes it was all over the place but I had to put it together were you thinking about pitching the story to publishers Mm -hmm. uh, when I was writing the story, uh, b believe me, um, about finding a publisher was not even my concern. I just wanted to put the story together somehow to tell the story. Then once I am very comfortable about it, maybe I might look for publishers, and which I found already. Um, but my main concern was to finish it, to write the story and put it out there one way or the other. And as I mentioned earlier, this is, I, I, I took it as my duty, as my obligation to, to talk about Red Terror. It has to be told. And I wish they tell them in classrooms, especially in Ethiopia, and young uh, students have to learn about it in high schools and others it has to be told and uh, this is and i think that's what what was behind all of that mm. my effort so my main aim was not just the glory to find the glory but for myself or to be seen as a writer i'm not sure people <laughs> can, it's it's it wasn't that i just wanted it has to, to be get it out. to get it out and one way or another it is like I said it's a window mm. it's a tiny lens through which anybody can see through 
what was happening and so it was a uh, publishing or finding a publisher it was not even a primary thing for me at the time um, do you plan on 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 getting it uh it's only available in English now, yes. right? Yes, I am uh, working on uh, translating it into uh, Amharic and, uh, and maybe later on to Tigrinya as well. Uh, I am planning to make a film about it. And uh, I am already, right now, I'm working on a script. Wow, I was just going to ask you about that because I'm, I'm sure that there's... there's uh, you know, of course, a, uh, a film, also even maybe even a play, mm -hmm. right? Even a radio play. Like, um, th th there's a lot of room for for uh, additional stories. Do you plan on uh, on on producing and writing more stories? Yes, I do. I don't have anything right now in mind, but uh, that's one of uh, I will have to work so much about it. One of the things I. I am writing on Ethiopian music as well mm. uh, because uh, there are a few genres in Ethiopian music styles that that are fascinating because in Ethiopia our music and our lyrics our poetry are they are very connected to the land and to the people so you would hear a, a, a love story a love song but you will hear also a scenery a mountain or river at face value, they may not be congruent, but if you're an Ethiopian, when you listen to it, it it's it it moves you from inside. So, I'm writing on this uh, uh, on some stories related to music and others. I probably uh, do some sort of documentaries on them. It's already finished. Uh, uh, the, the the question prior to that was. Uh, what was that? Uh, but basically, uh, asking you whether you planned on on, on yes. doing other forms, you know. Yeah. Like. Uh, but I do. But you mentioned about the play and uh, the radio play. Yeah. Radio uh, but in terms of a movie or film, it was an idea that came from some of my non-Ethiopian readers. Um, they kind of describe it as very uh, descriptive. So they kind of envision uh, the story. They followed, you know, uh, my heroes throughout the book. And uh, even my publisher mentioned that it should have been on a on a on a film or something. And but I all already had thought about it. So uh, I am working on a script, and it has to be done in Ethiopia. And I have to be uh, involved in in the way it has to be uh, shot or the way it has to be presented. Recently, I saw a promotional video uh, that was shot in Ethiopia, promoting Ethiopia's uh, economy. It's uh, how it's diversified itself. How it's um, you know, it's more or less a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Some might say it's a powerhouse in African, uh, you know, economics in terms of industry growth over the last uh, decade or so. And, uh, you know, th there's a lot of stories there, right? There's a lot of stories there. And, and of course, the cinema or film scene there is booming. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of films. Yes. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could easily, if you went there, you could easily find plenty of actors mm -hmm. who'd be willing to participate in this and a, a huge crew. Of course, yes. Yes, I, I do believe so. Uh, and, again, um, for one thing is to, to be able to impart that whatever the book is trying to tell that emotional sentiment and all that to the people who are going to play those uh, those characters so I have to sit down and you know talk with the people whether they are seasoned actors or new I have to deal with them it because it is a story that I took so much time and effort to write and and I guess I I can spend that much effort and time to make it right, you know. So, so you're going to be very involved. I will. Uh, yes, I am. And uh, because it's for one thing, it's my script. I want right. to. And of course, it's open to editing and to all kind of opinions. And uh, but at the same time, I would need uh, 
the skills of many other writers, directors, and uh, not just actors. I will need yeah. uh, the skills of all these people. There's so plenty of them in Ethiopia. Man. There are, so. and uh, I am sure that uh, once I'm done with my script, which is almost done, and uh, I plan, I, I plan ahead and go down there. Uh, I guess it will it will be okay. It will be done, and. Uh, I'm sure, I look forward to that. I'm sure it will be probably more appealing than the book itself. I'm going to put you on the spot and, and ask two, two questions that are probably um, whatever. I'm just going to ask them. Let's say uh, this book lands in the hands of, of someone who uh, was a perpetrator uh, somehow involved in this Red Dare. What, what message do you think they will get out of the novel? In particular to those. Because as we know, some of them are still around. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and they've never been brought to justice. Some have been brought to justice. Yeah, not all of them. Many of them they probably live in the West and uh, they, nobody knows who they are. Uh, but for one thing, uh, if they... If they find my book, I don't think they will be uh, willing to read it. The moment they see the word Red Terror, they will just try to put it down. Denial. There is always that, that denial. And uh, I don't know, some of them, I'm not sure if somehow they find a way to reconcile themselves either through religion or other ways. I don't know, but many, they will always have that denial. And uh, and again, they might still think that it was the right thing to do for them. You know, we have to deal with some psychopaths here. Some of them are. There is no remorse. And I don't expect any remorse from any one of them. It's not about them to admit what they have done. It's for us to remember, to acknowledge that this had happened to us. We the proud nation, the proud society. It had happened to us. Is for us to tell the story. So, those uh, cruel and criminal individuals, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't even care whether they read my book or not, and uh, it's not a, it's not an effort for them to admit what they have done. And I don't think we care whether they admit it or not because right. they have done it. We know it. Right. It's it's a historical record. Sure. But um, now, yeah. just to follow up on that, yeah. um, and, and this is probably not an appropriate question to ask, but I, I'm I'm gonna ask it e either way. Uh, Mengistu Halamariam, yeah. he's he's still alive. He yeah. he's he was the dictator. Uh, yes. um, he's the perpetrator. He, the, yeah. This was his plan. Yeah. Yes. What would you tell him if if you could? share a few words with him and I know I'm putting you on the spot mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just curious what would you tell him I guess the question would be like everybody else's question why that would be the question the big why I mean uh, I, I prefer in, in the story there's a question addressed in the book is the question how how was it possible that this happened to us and we know why but I wanted to hear it from the real individual why did you do that to your own people you're not a foreign invader you are not a tyrant who's coming from another country you are a member of a community a society that nurtured you how could you take a power and try to simulate something that had happened elsewhere in Europe or other places and do these horrifying things to the people uh, that are even abhorred by family feud. It's in Ethiopia, sometimes when there is a family conflict, there is intermarriage between the two feuding family to avoid blood, bloodshed, blood spill. That's the kind of people who we are. How could you bring red terror and, and execute individuals on the, in front of their families and on the street and uh, like they were animals? And why? That would be the question, but I doubt it. I would, I would probably see him. I would probably not even talk to him. I mean, 
uh, you will probably find something that uh, he would ask a question at the end and she answered her question as well similar question but also she answers it so I think asking him the question that he already knows I mean uh, there won't be any point it just right now for me it just to make sure that we start talking about this as, as much as we could tell the world tell our soul tell our children our generation and so that this may not happen again and also it's it's a measure of our strength Ethiopia is a very strong country we are very strong people this had happened at one point and that's why it's the darkest chapter in our history but we always revive ourselves we get up again so I hope uh, and uh, you know this will uh, make many people rethink again re-examine the past and come to terms with it and at the same time feel free to talk about it even victims uh, immediate victims or families of the victims as I told you when I went to uh, few we a few months ago I went to America and I met with individuals whose family were tortured and uh, executed and I can't show you the the feeling that I had when they told me that they were very glad that I wrote about it so I guess that's what it is the most important for us is not whether um, to know whether he or others will admit to it I don't think we care about that right it just we have to acknowledge that we have to acknowledge this dark history uh, of our our nation you put the time in to write this novel and now it's out there people will want to read it but now you have opened the door to more novels and more stories in different forms be it film uh, be it non-fictional you know documentary so I I'm looking forward to to reading your novel and I hope that you keep you know producing more because uh, you know when I was in Ethiopia I had the opportunity when I was filming there I had the opportunity to speak uh, at, uh, at this Ababa like film uh, group this big group and uh, there was a Q&A session where, where you know people were asking me questions about uh, th this documentary that I'm working on on mar martial arts in uh, Judo and Jiu Jitsu in Ethiopia and I kept reiterating the fact that hey guys you know like you have stories here and your job is to tell them right like and and you have to be your own storytellers at, at the end of the day we have to be our own storytellers and um like i said from in the beginning i think ethiopians some of the best stories uh, and where we're going to end now but I, I just gotta tell you some of the best poets storytellers just public speakers i've met are Ethiopian and I'm not gonna mention them by name that's not even the point and it's not to say oh they're Ethiopian therefore they're great uh, at this it's not even a you know that type of uh, angle it's I'm not kidding when I say this some of the best poets and public speakers I know are Ethiopian some are in this city you know what I mean there's just there's this rich oral culture and and I, I'm I'm glad that um, you, you're telling these stories now. The question is, where can I? Where can people find your book? Where can people find you? Yeah. Uh, well, I have a, a website. Uh, for, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, talking about the Ethiopians in uh, such a uh, uh, emotional, <laughs> uh, great emotional uh, reverence. Uh, yes, Ethiopia is a, it's a land of writers and poets and all that. And uh, yeah. Um, I'm sure that uh, many would probably take my book as motivation to write more and more whether it's about our history or anything else and if I have done that to some people believe me that would be a great honor um, in terms of uh, my book I have a website it's called uh, Ademai because this town the town that took place uh, the story took place where Gideon Suyum and Hewitt lived it at Demai, A-D-I-M-A-Y 
dot net and that's where my book is um, and there is also uh, a page where they can make any order uh, I am right now I'm in the process of publishing it into an electronic book and also I will make it more available uh, electronically for people who would prefer to read it or on their iPod or uh, uh, other readers Kindle so uh, yeah but right now it's on my website and also people can also Google by the title that they can find the title on Google and it will prompt them to my website where they have uh, uh, a place or a page even to comment about my book and I welcome all comments as well fantastic uh, thank you very much thank you uh, I, 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 I hope to do a follow-up after I'm, I'm done, once I'm once I'm done reading the book, I'm gonna. I'd like to interview you again sure. and give you my uh, my my point of view on the book and 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 my favorite characters and and I, yeah, I you look know. forward to that, uh, Gurmami. Thank you for taking the time, taking the time to interview me. Uh, it was a great. Uh, I just I don't see you as an uh, a journalist interviewing me. I'm just talking to a fellow Ethiopian, mm. a person whom uh, I thought should know now that you were not born and you were not raised in that era so for me you are one of my ideal audiences hmm. so I'm glad that you took the time to uh, talk to me uh, uh, allow me to discuss about my book and I really appreciate that you're very welcome and thank you for sharing you're welcome thank you <laughs> thank you for listening to conversations with Garmami for more information visit garmami.com that's g-a-r-m-a-m-i-e dot com G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E dot com.